Hello and welcome to the BYU Library Family History webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all of the questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on January 25th with Larry Jensen. He will be giving a presentation on understanding German cultural background. Um, this is a pre-recorded lecture with no Q&A section. However, Larry Jensen's contact information will be provided at the end of the webinar. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on 10 serious challenges to genealogical research. Before we begin, here's a little bit about James. James has over 40 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star Blog. He has served as a family history volunteer for 18 years and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is a professional photographer and has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. And we'll now turn the time over to James. Okay, we'd like to welcome whenever, everyone here to another BYU Library Family History Center webinar. Uh, today we're going to be talking about 10 I guess I'm the one going to be talking about 10 serious challenges to genealogical research. And uh, although this is a, a focusing in on challenges, uh, I think we could basically change the word challenges to opportunities because there's many opportunities here to become involved in genealogy beyond uh, doing your own personal research and, and uh, working in a library or something all the time because these are kinds of, of, of challenges that involve the entire genealogical, greater genealogical community and, and a lot of other organizations from national uh, countries of the world to uh, down to local levels of even of local libraries and archives. So one of the things that's important, and of course we all understand that as time passes that there are certain social, economic, and cultural factors that do not bode well for the future of genealogical research. There's things out there that um, have happened in the past and then will continue to happen in the future. And we're going to I will explore some of these and go through the process of how this uh, kind of affects in, uh, each individual uh, one of the uh, challenges that we have. Um, one kind of a introductory mention is that uh, almost all of the images for this presentation have been generated by artificial intelligence, uh, generative intel uh, imagery. And uh, the reason for that is very simple, because when you generate an image, uh, according to the U.S., uh, in the Supreme Court of the United States, for example, there are no copyright restrictions on that. And they're kind of a one-off one -off thing. And so they're very helpful for putting together presentations because I don't have to worry about copyright and I can get the image uh, pretty much what I describe to, that I want to be uh, represented and to get some very interesting uh, images. But... Um, one of the problems uh, that is a, it's a benefit and a problem at the same time. Uh, the benefit is that we have large online genealogy companies and I'm not picking on any one company. It's, it's the fact that uh, what has happened in genealogy is that it's become, uh, the word is monetized, meaning that there's a lot of money involved in what's going on with, with the records and, and supplying records and obtaining records. And uh, what you get from the large companies is that they're the future of genealogy. They're, they're online collections of documents and they have billions and billions of records. And this is where you have to go to do your genealogy. 
the reality is, is that um, uh, despite all this information that we have online, these billions of records and DNA testing and whatever, we still have at best kind of a murky genealogical future. There's there's too many other factors going on here besides uh, just um, uh, the, the things that uh, you would think of in conjunction with these large companies that are online. And looking at this, uh, the future lies with the individual decisions of the greater worldwide genealogical community. And this presentation is more a call to action. In other words, the, the intent of what I, to go through these challenges, the intent is specifically to uh, have some interesting goals, things that you could really get involved with and, uh, and develop a, a lot of uh, benefit to the, to the rest of the genealogical community. Uh, one of those obviously is uh, what I've elected to do, and that is to focus on on teaching and support and doing webinars and and classes and and uh, presentations around the country and around the world. So this is there are various ways to get involved. And as I go through these different, uh, obviously pre-selected ten things, that we will probably we will have a lot of things that uh, should occur as uh, as action items, things that we could all jointly do, and many of which I've been very much involved in, and so I'll be uh, mentioning some of those. One of the first ones that is a concern uh, is the abandonment of the training of cursive handwriting. Um, this was brought home to me. Um, many of my grandchildren, they mentioned they have a lot of grandchildren, but uh, many of my grandchildren are, are now in high school, in college, and graduated, work out working in the in the uh, world of work. And uh, uh, I have some time ago, I decided that I needed one of my local grandchildren to uh, ask him if he would like to come over and help me a little bit with some records, and I would pay him a few dollars to to help me. Uh, I think that works best for for them and for me. Uh, basically, I got him here and he sat there for about an hour or so and was working on the computer. Very familiar with the computer. It wasn't a difficulty. He knew exactly what I wanted to do. And uh, after about an hour, he said, Grandpa, there's something I have to tell you. I can't read cursive. And so we were in a situation where, well, okay, I, let's figure out what else he could do besides this. And, and then I suggested, well, why don't you learn cursive here? If you're here and you're working, you can learn cursive. Well, that didn't work out quite as well as it probably could have in that circumstances. But but that brought home to me personally this the problem. And if we uh, look at it, uh, some of the statistics, it's hard to find exact statistics, but uh, if you do a little bit of research, and I've got at least one uh, link there, the cursive was removed from the common core standards for K through 12. What that means is that the federal government has uh, set some standards for education, and they're called the common core standards for K through 12. And as of 2023, there are only 20 state, 21 states that required some sort of cursive handwriting instruction. And uh, uh, I recently got a, a, uh, a Christmas card from one of our lovely families who lives across the country. And uh, it was uh, very, very apparent from the way that the children up through high school uh, signed the card that uh, they had had virtually no uh, uh, cursive instruction. Uh, you might say, well, everything's on a computer, so why do we need to learn cursive? Well, from the standpoint of genealogy, everything before typewriters, which, by the way, came out in about the latter part of the 1800s, or mechanical transcription devices, uh, which are generically called typewriters, the typewriter 
world uh, was the first world that, that enabled the individual to, to print what we would call uh, printed letters. And so this was uh, this, this process has now gone to the point where uh, children in school learn learn keyboards, but they don't necessarily learn how to do very much do very much handwriting. Even if they have a course or two in handwriting, it isn't like the old days when they started doing letters in kindergarten and every year up through uh, eighth grade. So basically this is uh, going to be a challenge because uh, learning a cursive is like learning a foreign language to some extent and learning to read cursive like this particular example is uh, is something that is uh, can be quite a challenge even to people who learned cursive in school still learning how to read various uh, cursive handwritings going back into the uh, 19th, the 20th and 19th and 18th and 17th centuries is is uh, is one of the major challenges. And so the fact that they have uh, discontinued to use cursive is uh, is the challenge here. And I guess here is a copy of uh, of the 1920 population schedule for the uh, federal census. Uh, population census. And the question I would ask is, and by the way, this is one of the easiest to read handwritings that you'll find in the census. This, this is practically perfect for reading. And the question is, can you read it or can your children or your grandchildren read this? And so uh, that's the basic issue, because if we are cut off simply by the fact that they cannot read the cursive handwriting, then uh, that's going to be a, a, a tremendous hurdle for people who uh, want to beginning do, to begin to do in research. And if you recognize this, you're going to in, anyone who lived here in the United States or in some other country that had a census record would realize this was a very basic record, and that inability to read this record is something that could be a, a real barrier to, uh, to to gaining even an interest in genealogy. So what can you do about it? Well, um, you can support uh, having cursives taught in schools. Uh, that may or may not be a popular project, but you can also learn cursive yourself and uh, help those who are interested in doing genealogy, teach classes, uh, help people to learn how to, how to read this type of handwriting. So, if you think that the young people are going to take over your job of doing research, which is a, kind of a theme of uh, some of the larger uh, genealogy online websites, then make sure they know how to read and write cursive because uh, their, their uh, involvement is not going to progress very far. Now, there is kind of a on the horizon sort of uh, uh, possible solution to the whole problem. And, and, and we may just avoid the whole issue because uh, it may not become necessary at all. And that is the technological development uh, of handwriting recognition. Uh, you might not know, or maybe you do, that uh, big loss, uh, big websites like Ancestry and Family Search and MyHeritage and others are now using advanced handwriting recognition to index to transcribe and then index handwritten records by the millions and millions. Uh, Family Search is, is focusing right now on uh, handwritten records in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian. And so these records are being digitized, uh, not just uh, digitized, they're already digitized. They're being transcribed uh, and then indexed for uh, and being put into the website by the millions. So that may, this may be a moot point and it may be, you know, but it's also go, always going to be possible for as long as probably any of us are alive that uh, you're going to get outside of these big uh, websites reach and uh, end up with documents, even letters from your, in your own family that may not be uh, legible because you never had experience. Now, number two, 
this is probably the next most important thing, and that is the issue of document preservation. And uh, we'll get more into this. Uh, there's a couple of these. They're all sort of related. Everything here is kind of related to the issue of being able to, to preserve the records. And document preservation is uh, something that we all need to be, as genealogists, need to be uh, kind of painfully aware uh, of what's happening. Uh, one of the primary reasons are just physical degradation of the, and the loss of paper-based records. And uh, that's just going to happen over time. Um, the, uh, especially records that are more current, what we think of old records, we think of old parchment records, those things, those records will last a, a very long time. The, the, the paper, they weren't paper, they were parchment or they were um, vel um, vellum. Uh, animal skins. So they're basically uh, ways of preserving paper and uh, and avoiding the physical loss of these records. But this once again is a, is a personal thing because if you have a pile of of uh, of family rec uh, family letters, for example, how do you what do you do with them? What do you do with the paper? How do you preserve them? Uh, and uh, it and even though we may try to preserve them uh, currently, um, we're basically into another problem, and that is that uh, smaller collections are ignored by the large online genealogy companies' digitation efforts. So let's say you have a few hundred or even a few thousand um, handwritten records from your family. Uh, the only way that those are going to get preserved is if you and your family make a, a concerted effort to digitize the records and preserve the paper records. We don't throw away the originals because they're a, an artifact. They're a, a historical artifact. And if they fall into that artifact category, they're, they're very important to have the actual original documents available that were handled by your ancestors. But on the other hand, from a preservation and a sharing and, and a, a benefit standpoint, personal digitization efforts are extremely important, that you digitize each of the records that you find and have, and then uh, make them available to your family. They're, it's easy to make them available with a website like Family Search because they have this huge memories section that's free, and uh, you can upload documents and, and uh, share them with your family. So this is... There are ways to avoid this constant drain and loss of the paper. Um, as I mentioned that the larger companies do not um, necessarily focus on smaller collections. There are some exceptions and there are some of the things that are going on and I'll talk about those as we go along because I said, as I said, these overlap. The, the economics of scale, the economies of scale, mandate that the large genealogy companies concentrate on large collections. Okay, so an example, uh, which is a personal, which we have a personal involvement, is uh, digitizing records by FamilySearch.org. FamilySearch uh, has over 300 cameras uh, around the world digitizing essentially because they're all over the world, they're digitizing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, someone is always out there in one of these cameras clicking away um, all the time. And, and millions and millions of these records flow into family search every year. Um, and those, uh, but those, there's the economy of scale here is that um, they have to have enough records in a in a particular collection to justify putting the equipment and the peoples on site for a period of time and enough time and enough size of the collection so that they they uh, they get their money's worth. Uh, it's not economic and it's not uh, reasonable, even practical for them to set up the whole structure and, and send people down to do a few hundred documents or a few thousand documents. I don't happen to know what the the the, uh, 
limit is here exactly out of my head, but I'm guessing it's into the millions of records and something of over a million or more records that would have a digitizing team available uh, working on it for enough time to make it worthwhile to set up that whole structure, which is, by the way, rather elaborate. So the development that might alleviate the impact is an increase in local presence preservation initiatives. If, if we could set up pre, uh, preservation on a local level, then you can basically uh, do that. Today, for example, a, uh, a book scanning camera uh, will cost well less than $1,000 and get a very good quality, high resolution book scanning that does a perfectly adequate job of, of scanning books and documents. Uh, for uh, a reasonable price. And uh, if that is put together and people use that. Now, what we do, for example, at the, the BYU library is that we have a whole variety of all different kinds of digital preservation. Uh, we have from everything from digitizing audio cassettes to uh, eight, and eight millimeter film and slides and books and, and obviously flatbed scanners for, for a variety of documents. And uh, we have those available for free. And at many other family search centers are beginning the process of, of, of obtaining that equipment and making it available. So there is a way to do local record re uh, preservation initiatives. Um, one re initiative that I became involved with was the Mesa uh, City Mesa, Arizona City Cemetery. And I discovered through tragic family circumstance that um, there was a lot of records in that cemetery, but it was a very small collection and not something that Family Search could digitize. But because I got involved with Family Search on a pilot program, I spent about two and a half years in that little cemetery building digitizing records back into the 1800s and those records ended up on family search but that's really kind of an exception to what can and will happen but in other words there's other other places that are willing to host those digital records there's libraries and there's uh, other archives and even universities and our university special collections libraries another one Another major, major challenge, and, and I'm not sure that there is a solution to this uh, in, the, in the immediate future, and that is a lack of history training uh, beginning in, in uh, grade school. Um, this can be a highly politicized issue, and I'm not going to get into any of the politics of it at all, but uh, the effect of it is, is that uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, students who go through our U.S. school system uh, receive very little training in, in, uh, in more than just a superficial training of history. I'm always interested to ask my grandchildren what, they're, what history they're studying and then ask them a few questions to see if they've actually uh, learned about that. Usually the, uh, the, the answer is, well, we, don't do, we haven't gotten there to that yet, yet, Grandpa. We don't do that. So, but it is a problem. And uh, for those of those people who I know personally who teach history classes are, are always wringing their hands over this particular circumstance. And, and these people, the history teachers are almost all of the consensus that there is not a, a high emphasis on teaching history, even in the university or college level. And that general knowledge of history among the upcoming generation of students is lacking. Um, one of the experiences that called this home to me was I was teaching a class, um, a genealogy class, to a, a group of adults, about 15 or 20 adults. I don't remember the exact number. And uh, I basically uh, was teaching that and I about US record sets. And I said to something to the effect of, well, whatever, what, you, what, you know, we, we well, of course you'll know what happened in the 1860s that would affect the kinds of records that you would be looking for and what, what was happening to the records. And they all sat there and looked at me and just kind of stared at me. And I said, well, you know, the 1860s and 
still no response. And I said, well, does he, do you know what happened in the 1860s in the United States? And they said, and nobody wanted to volunteer. I mean, maybe they were embarrassed at that point, but basically I had to go through and basically say, this. we're talking about the US Civil War. And they all went, oh, you mean, is that when that was? Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, so, you know, it's not, it's kind of a reality out there. So that's one of the problems. And <clears throat> one of the way, when, what you're going to see uh, when you go online and look at a large of uh, either the family, family uh, search uh, family tree, which is a unified collaborative tree, or the individual trees on the other websites like Ancestry or my heritage or whatever uh much of the information is genealogist as you go on there is just is is inaccurate simply because the people have put, put that information there have no concept of what has happened or where that where those like where the where that is uh, one of the uh, most obvious uh, examples of this in the genealogical realm is is when you look at U.S. Census records from the 1800s, the late 1800s, uh, mid to 1800s, and you'll find uh, people who are listed as having come from Germany when the date is in the 1815 to 1860, 70, or whatever. And of course, the problem with that is that that's a general uh, reflection of people who spoke a language that they understood to be German. And so they came from Germany, but there was no country named Germany as such. And there was no, uh, and it was a splinter of, uh, of many, many different countries, which makes it really difficult for people to begin the process of doing research for their German ancestors that when they begin to understand how complex the history is and how difficult it is sometimes to identify exactly where your ancestors came from and what country they lived in, what small duchy or or what area of the of the of the European continent that they lived in. So it's possible that societal development might alleviate the impact and have a re, we might have a resurgence of teaching history in all school levels, but. Um, it's a good thing to do when you're a genealogist is to realize that genealogy is history. And so that learning the history of the places where you're doing research is part of the process of doing genealogy. Um, one of the other obvious things is there's a huge, and uh, I mean, it, it's overwhelming avalanche of information uh, in our society. Uh, and it's growing <clears throat> just by uh, monumentally growing. And, and it's to the point where it's overwhelming for people to even begin the process. Um, I have a rule that I've, uh, and one of my rules is that there is always more records. And today that's uh, almost infinitely true. There are always more records. But the question is working your way through the pile working your way through how you're going to go about finding this information. Uh, we have some really interesting tools that are being developed uh, just recently, and that's uh, what I mentioned previously is artificial intelligence, and they're called chatbots, and they are basically super, uh, kind of super search engines. They can, they can search a lot of information and put it out in a way that's uh, very, uh, it's conversational, and you're able to just ask questions and get answers. Um, it, this is a, an area that's evolving so rapidly that uh, what I, what was said last week is to almost probably a, completely out of date about what's going on with uh, with uh, chat bots and chat companies. Uh, the biggest company player in this now is Microsoft, and they have what they started to call Microsoft Bing chat and now it's called Microsoft Copilot and it's even being integrated into their Microsoft computers directly uh, as it is with Apple and all the other computer companies. And this is a marvelous tool 
and it has a tendency to uh, help us to tame this. Um, and early on, uh, when you say early on, you mean about a year ago, when uh, chatbots began uh, through what was called chat GPT began to be used, they were kind of an interesting phenomenon. And, and uh, there were two sides. One said it was revolutionary. The other was said that it was going to kill everybody off or that it was the end of the world. Well, it was actually neither. It's basically a very advanced uh, computer search mechanism that that has a way that on a structure of, of being able to interact instead of just putting in uh, search terms, you can actually ask questions uh, vocally if you want to, you can talk to it and, and get responses back. Uh, the question is how accurate is it? The answer is it's only as accurate as the computer in the database. And uh, if you expected it to be 100% accurate, then you were probably not used to doing searches where you got 2 million responses to a very simple uh, search term. So this is, is something that's possible that's going to help us to kind of tame this huge pile of information. Uh, and sometimes it's seen as a benefit and not as a detriment to doing research. Yeah, I mean, it's research is great because now we have all these records. Well, the answer is, yeah, we have all these records, but do you know how to use all these records or do you know how to find all these records? And so because there's so much information and so many places to look, it's become a challenge rather than a solution to the genealogical problem. So what is the amount of data that's being, being generated? Okay, so we're generating 2.5 quintillion or 2.5 exabytes of data every day. Okay, so an exabyte, and I'll, I'll show you how they work out, but if you could, I don't gonna read this whole thing, but it basically, uh, is uh, uh, will by 2023, as of 2023, they were 328.77 million terabytes or of, D of data were created every day. And it equates to 100 zettabytes per year, 10 zettabytes per month, and 2.31 zettabytes per week. And so if you're looking at the, the tremendous amount of information it's just the numbers are in, it's just overwhelming so here's where it comes a byte a kilobyte megabyte gigabytes terabytes petabytes exabytes so maybe you know now about a terabyte of information and you may even have a terabyte 5 10 8 16 terabyte hard drive uh, and you may have heard of petabytes, uh, the next step is exabytes and then zettabytes. And you can imagine how much information that is flowing out of the uh, internet today. So the co-pilots, the pilots, uh, the, the chat bots is the generic term. That's C-H-A-T-B-O-T-S, chat bots. Uh, and what they're now being called as co-pilots from now Microsoft's co-pilot is the main main one. So if you have uh, uh, the uh, Edge uh, browser and uh, Bing search, then you uh, probably are, and if you have one that's up to date, like to Windows 10 or Windows 11, uh, you probably have access to the Microsoft Copilot already on your computer. You just have to open it up and look at it. So one of the other issues, which is sort of the other side of the digitization project is the unsure future of digital preservation. Now, uh, in order to preserve all this information uh, for any one of the big genealogy companies, uh, there is a tremendous uh, effort that needs to be made to create uh, what are called server farms. In other words, there's uh, pi uh, acres and acres of, of computers that are all hooked together that uh, are recording all this information. Uh, fortunately, the, the, the ability, the size of each of the individual units, the each, each individual hard drive or storage device 
are uh, expanding rapidly also. Uh, and uh, it's, but it's a question is when uh, the, the, the question is the vulnerability of these particular institutions, these server farms. So what's going to happen? Well, they're they're subject to all of the uh, problems of the world as far as danger. Uh, so digitizing the records moves the process of preserving those records from the physical threats of digitiz of the paper, like bugs and small and uh, mold and things like that, to the more esoteric things of electronic migration and hacking and and the fact that these uh, the computers and need the electricity and if the electricity goes down um, you know in other words there's a, there's a challenge there and it's not a challenge we can work with on an international basis uh, it's more on a very local or national basis in the addition to that we uh, have done or paid, we have our own computers and we need to be backed up to our computers we need our computers backed up. We could lose all of our information with one power surge. And so um, uh, I was in a presentation last week or so ago uh, talking. I wasn't in a presentation, but I was talking to uh, some of my, some of the people across the world and and my computer disappeared, just stopped. And uh, it was only out for a matter of a few minutes, but it was... Uh, uh, surprising, and that's the kind of thing that can happen here with these, um, with uh, the electronic records. So how do we do it? Well, we back it up. Uh, if you have it on your computer, then you get an external device, either a, a flash drive or a hard disk drive, and you back it up to that hard disk drive. If you're me and you've been through years and years of losing data, then you will back it up to a second hard drive. And if you're me, then you back it up to a third hard drive. And then you add online storage to it. You back your entire computer and all your hard drives up uh, online. And uh, that's the way I preserve my, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of uh, eight terabytes of information that I have on my own computers. So that's kind of the, the way that we address that issue. So think about that this change in technology is another aspect of this change in, uh, in, in being able to keep and maintain records. So how many records do you think were lost with the demise of the three and a half inch floppy disks? Now, technically, you can still recover information off of a floppy disk and it depends on the format it's in but if it's in a program that no longer is available uh, in a format that's no longer available uh, you have to spend quite a bit of money to get somebody to get in there and see if they can salvage any information it's not impossible but it's very difficult and over the years that i've been working at the byu library originally um, we would we had the the drives and things to actually um, transcribe old floppy disks. So we were we were uh, salvaging old floppy disks occasionally uh, back at the days in Mesa when I was working the Mesa Family Search Library. They basically um, spent a lot of time uh, getting people's information off of floppy disks. And sometimes they were damaged and there was no way we could get the information because they were toast. They were not, they're not, not going to be readable at all. So one of the one of the very important things here is to migrate as the technology continues. So uh, you know, we're we it's when I say migrate, that means if you have it in today's version of Word on your computer and you then you update, and as you update make sure all your old files are updated to the new new version or are still readable or put them in a format like a text file format that that can be used by all different kinds of programs so there's this whole process of digital preservation is a process you can, you should uh, learn about and the simplest way to do learn about any of this information from any of the things that I talked about here is quite straightforward and simple. Sit down at your computer and ask, start typing in questions to the computer 
how do I do digital preservation? What, what is digital preservation? Uh, where do I go to find out about digital preservation? And uh, if you do that, if you ask those questions long enough, I'll tell you where you'll end up. You'll end up at the Library of Congress and, and their preservation directive at the Library of Congress of the United States. They're setting the, the standards for all of this. So basically, this is an educational process here. The challenge here is, is helping and educating people and uh, making them aware of the need and also telling them and showing them how to use backups and, and how to basically do that. And that's a nice thing about having the BYU Library Family History Center YouTube channel, because when these video and these classes are, are um, finished, we upload them to the, B, to the YouTube channel. And uh, there's lots of records on digital preservation and I've done uh, a, quite a few um, specific how to, how to preserve your documents, uh, presentations, which by the way, do not go out of fashion or get it old, other than the fact that there are larger hard disks to use today. Another one uh, issue, of course, is political pressure. And I'm not going to talk about the politics here, but uh, there's a lot of politics going on with uh, getting records. And if you want a, a good introduction to what's going on and how it works, uh, this is a website, and it's called Reclaim the Records. And all you have to do is type in on a Google search or a, a search on uh, on Microsoft uh, Edge or Bing, a Bing search of uh, Reclaim the Records, and you'll find a, a wealth of information about what they're doing. This is a group of attorneys who have uh, or spending their time in a nonprofit uh, suing for access to records that are being held, in a sense, captive by uh, local governments because they're making money off the records when there are what are called Freedom of, Inter of Information Acts that require those, um, they're called FOI uh, actions, and they are basically bringing court action to get the records released so that they can be put out in the, in the public domain and made available to the world. And they've been successful in doing this with millions of records. And uh, unfortunately, many governments around the world have sunset laws for records. And so what they do after so many years is that they destroy all the records. And you'll find if you go around and do research in various countries around the world, you will find countries where they simply did not keep their records. Um, for example, Australia is one uh, that has uh, that their census records are not as available as they could be because they have a sunset law. So a lot of this, in addition, other records are lost because of inaction of the governments to provide for their preservation. Um, if you're a genealogist for any period of time in the United States, you learn rather quickly that uh, you have uh, one census, whole census, 10-year census, uh, missing the 1890 census. And the story that's commonly told is that there was a fire and the census was destroyed. Actually, that's not completely correct. There was a fire. Part of the census was damaged, but... The Library of Congress, who had responsibility for the records at that time, failed to appropriate any funds to preserve the records that had been damaged. And so after, in a, after a time period of different budget things happened, the records were destroyed. So what was left of the records, which by the way was more than a majority of the records, um, was uh, were thrown away, not just lost in a fire as would be whatever possibility. And if you go here to the National Archives, you can read that whole story and it's pretty tragic, but it's a good example of this particular issue. And uh, if you go around the world, of course, because of wars and other things uh, and documents that are not available, you know very well that uh, if you try to do research in some countries that there is 
uh, that is tremendously difficult to get to their documents. Uh, and this is uh, one article and there's nothing, no significance about this particular article. I'm not telling everybody to go out and read it or anything. I just used it as an example um, that uh, of some records, very important records who were, uh, who were destroyed by the British government because of political reasons. So if you want to get around this, make sure that your local records are being digitized uh, from your lo that are, are genealogically valuable. And uh, if you think the records aren't genealogically valuable, then you need to just look at them carefully and see what kind of information is in them. Because it may turn out that what you think would not be genealogically valuable may be very genealogically valuable. Um, this general lack of appreciation of genealogically important documents is something that happens on an individual family basis. I'm, I was actually in a uh, uh, presenting at a, a genealogy uh, seminar conference in Florida when one of the members of the genealogical society there in Florida walked in the door carrying some boxes and said that this was one of their long time members of the genealogical society. And he said that this person had passed away and he went by to see how the family was getting along just in time to, to intercept them on the way to the dumpster with all of his genealog genealogical records. So he grabbed those records and was bringing them down to the society. So, uh, you know, individual preservation efforts are important. On a repetitive basis around the, the time I find that as I, the longer I'm around as a genealogist and the more people know about it, the more records uh, seem to flow towards me. And now we have uh, tens of thousands of documents in our basement. And the question is, what am I doing with it? As we have digitized virtually all those documents, uh, we're still in the process of sorting them, but many of those million thousands of those and tens of thousands of them that are important enough to to uh, preserve are on family search uh, and or will be on family search um this is another issue this is a side issue to the preservation issue and that is that some genealogists are so protective of their work that they won't let anybody look at it and then then when they die of course all of it are gets thrown away because nobody has an appreciation for what's there. Uh, I'm not picking on any one person, but this has happened. Uh, I've interacted with people personally with the children and they will come to me and say, well, what do we do with mom's all mom's records? And I say, well, let me look at them and I'll tell you. And I've gone into their homes and looked at the records and say, well, this, these records need to be preserved. These are valuable records. There's, 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 a lot of documents and records here that need to be digitized and put online. And uh, do you know if your mother did that? Well, anyway, there's a long discussion going on. And then and sadly, in, in some circumstances, that uh, simply ends up with them saying, well, we don't have time to do all that right now. Thank you for letting us know. And and then the last that's the last I hear. And in one case, that was the last I heard that they had uh, sort of put them in a closet because they needed the room that their mother had used and et cetera, and et cetera. So we need to know about and be aware of the potential loss and try to get as many documents as possible. Now, you wouldn't think this was a, uh, a detrimental problem of, of monumental uh, size unless you get into it. And that is, uh, you, there are millions and millions of fam individual family trees so the, 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 the problem here when you have an individual family tree is that you're not going to all agree. And so there's lots of disagreement between the family trees. Uh, and how much disagreement is, is unknown because each of these people have an individual family tree and it's private and they, no one can look at it or change it. Um, or even if they can look at it, if it's publicly lookable, they can't change it or do anything about it, and they can try to talk to the people. But uh, the accuracy is uh, overall is probably not as good as we would wish it to be. And now what we have, of course, is the family search family tree, which is a unified tree. There's all one tree 
all the information's in there. And so what do you think happens with the family tree? It's not a surprise. There are people who refuse to work on the family tree because it's inaccurate or their people keep changing the information. Well, yeah. Uh, and that's just simply a reflection of this unsupported family tree issue out there. I just did a consultation in the last hour uh, from, uh, from one of the countries in South America. And uh, you know, this, this, that was one of them, but I'm gonna, this is another one that, that I did the same time. This one was from Sweden. And uh, yes, we had a part of the family search family tree, but it had no sources. There was no way to tell whether this information was correct. And the person who was asking who was saying, well, what do I have to do? And I had to say, well, you have to go back and figure out if it's correct. And that uh, is not a very interesting thing for somebody who, uh, whose real interest did not lie in doing Swedish research, for example. Um, so it's just inevitable. The number, there's always going to be a margin of error. There's going to be a, man, a number of trees that are, are just absolutely not correct. And so when we're talking about that kind of number of trees, that's the difficulty. And this is the thing that information runs downhill. It means that over time, there's a thing called entropy, which says that, that, that things tend to get randomized. And so basically that's what happened to information. The more you're there and uh, the more it is, it's, but this is an, another education issue. Oh, I'm not gonna dwell on this one at hardly at all because it's, uh, it's obvious uh, that there's still a lot of places. Every time there's a huge flood or an earthquake or a fire and a, a village or town or city is destroyed, uh, of course, as a genealogist, we think of the, the loss of life and the loss of, of people's lives. But we also think that, oh boy, how many of those records were destroyed in that? And I wonder how much records we now have are not going to be able to find. And the more records they are and the more they're spread out around the world, the more possibilities that they're going to be destroyed. And uh, the older the records are, the more likelihood that that's the case because they will be centralized in larger areas that could be subject to destruction. And they can be floods or earthquakes, fires, just about anything else, and also just neglect, rodents, insects, mold, and everything else. So it's a national and local issue. And but the the preservation begins with decisions made by individuals. And this is the last one I chose, and that is a general impression that genealogy is easy. Uh, it's not easy. It's it's a very intense and involved multi-tasking um, type of area where you have to know things from everything from handwriting to history to geography to uh, languages to you know, just customs and local customs and everything else. And on top of that, how to preserve and how to do genealogy. So. Uh, it's not easy. And the, and the sales of the large companies who keep telling people that this is easy and that you can do it uh, does, does a disservice to those of us who have, have spent long years trying to learn how to do this and are still in the process of learning. And it's, uh, but it is important that we recognize that it's a serious thing and, and we do not necessarily help ourselves by um, telling people that it's easy and that it's uh, not something that they need to take seriously. So the concept that it's fun and easy is kind of says that you just can do it in your spare time. You don't really have to know anything. You never have to become involved and that it's kind of like a picnic. You just do it when you want to and, and uh, it's just a fun thing to do and that's it. So... Uh, Welcome to the genealogical picnic, I guess, is my suggestion here. So what can you do? Learn how to do well what you do as a genealogist and someone interested in genealogy where possible. Make sure you have copies of all your documents and include this and make sure that you source, add sources to everything that you enter. And that will help to raise the, the uh, level of, of uh, 
the genealogical community. And then there's a general uh, recognize that there is a greater genealogical community and that through education and hard work, we can uh, help and support and teach and, and be involved in, in uh, all of the activities that we've talked about. Okay, and this is not a computer generated image. It is a photograph, which I personally took. Okay, any quick questions or what do we need? So we have a question from Rose. She says, with the issue stated in number eight, why not allow DNA to be added to the family tree in family search? Um, the answer to that is that there is an ongoing discussion um, about implementing and including DNA with the family search family tree. And uh, I think that it's inevitably will happen on the timing on that. I never want to predict the timing of what it takes engineers to do anything. So it's basically that um, uh, something that is they're very aware of, and uh, I personally know that we're that they're involved in in discussing. So that's just all I can say at the point, but it will be there some point in time. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on January 25th with Larry Jensen. He will be giving a presentation entitled Understanding German Cultural Background. This is a pre-recorded lecture with no Q&A section. However, Larry Jensen's contact information will be provided at the end of the webinar. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fh underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.